Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Robert Gonzalez, the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning here. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2022 Jeff Harner Award Ceremony and Lecture. I'm gonna start with a land acknowledgement. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia, the original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. So I wanna begin with a thank you. And is Alan Thorne, I'm sorry, is uh, Alan Oliver in the room? No, okay. Uh, it's important that he be here, but I'm gonna go ahead and start. And if, if um, he joins us, then he can chat a little bit. But I wanted to start just by thanking the Thornburg Foundation uh, who makes this award program possible. I'd like to thank Garrett Thornburg, chairman of the board of the Thornburg Foundation. Mr. Thornburg personally leads the company's philanthropic efforts. The Thornburg Foundation invests in enduring solutions to help solve problems affecting people and our planet. In the last 10 years, the foundation has awarded more than $42 million in grants to outstanding nonprofits across New Mexico. It launched three strategic initiatives in the areas of good government reform, early childhood education, and food and agriculture. In 2021, the foundation added a new strategic initiative focused on advancing water policy reform, seeking to, pos to positively transform water management in New Mexico. Uh, thank you also to Leslie Garcia, Administrative Director of the Community Funding um, and Community Funding Officer for the Thornburg Foundation, and Alan Oliver, who is the Executive Director of the, of the Thornburg Foundation. Um, so before I introduce our Jeff Harner Award lectures tonight, I would also like to thank Rachel Jump, our Administrative Assistant to the Dean, for helping us to organize this event. And also uh, big thanks to Assistant Professor Anthony Fettis uh, for coordinating this year's program. And I'm gonna turn the program over uh, to him after our keynote tonight. So we begin tonight's program with the Jeff Harner keynote lecture. And this year, we are honored to introduce to you the internationally recognized firm Mass Design Group which was just awarded the 2022 AIA Architecture Firm of the Year Award. Yay. It's so perfect to have uh, Mass join us this evening for many reasons, including um, how well they are connected to the strategic goals of the university, to our own approach to pedagogy here at the school, and also to our growing relationship with the Thornburg Foundation. MASS, which stands for Model for Architecture Serving Society, believes that architecture has a critical role to play in supporting communities to collectively heal among many other aspirations. Founded as a nonprofit architectural practice in 2008 by Michael Murphy, with a fundamental question, can buildings heal? It is now a collaborative of more than 140 architects, designers, planners, and strategists. For our profession, the very nature of this kind of practice is helping us to eclipse the historic black caped architect persona, the single male owned or male uh, partner owned architecture firm. Um, and it is changing uh, our entire approach to how we think that architecture firms should uh, evolve. Mass's promotion of and devotion to social justice and human dignity sets a positive example for our students to see what an alternative uh, kind of practice might look like. 
Some of Mass's most well-known projects include the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which is also known by some as the Lynchy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, the Haven Domestic Violence Shelter in Bozeman, Montana, the Gun Violence Memorial Project constructed for the Chicago Architecture Biennial and then reinstalled at the National Building Museum, the Gaskio Tuberculosis Hospital in Haiti, and the Pulse Memorial and the Museum for Equality both in Orlando, Florida, and there are many, many more projects like these. We're honored to have two of Mass's principals join us today. Principal Joseph Kunkel directs the company Sustainable Native Communities Design Lab in Santa Fe, and Patricia Gruitz is Senior Principal and Managing Director of their Boston office. Joseph, a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation, is a community designer and educator focusing on sustainable development practices throughout Indian country. His work includes exemplary American Indian housing projects and processes nationwide. His research work has developed into emerging best practices leading to an online healthy homes roadmap for tribal housing development funded by HUD's BDNR office. In 2019, Joseph was awarded the Obama Foundation Fellowship for his work with indigenous communities. Joseph is a fellow of the inaugural class of the Civil Society Fellowship, a partnership with the ADL and the Aspen Institute, and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Most recently, Joseph was named the 2022 Rubinger Community Fellow. He received his degrees from the University of Maryland and the University of Hartford, and we're excited that he joined us last year as we launched our Summer Academy for Architecture and Design. For Mass Design Group, Patricia leads design and research projects centered around health, education, and equity. Since joining Mass in 2013, she has led design, the design of the Maternity Waiting Village in Malawi with the Malawi Ministry of Health, the African Leadership University, a series of primary schools in East Africa and the Africa Wildlife Foundation, the M Squared Foundation and the development of the Ellen DeGeneres campus of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. Wow. The first time I think of Ellen DeGeneres and gorillas in the same picture. Um, Patricia also collaborated with the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard to create guidelines for safe interaction in senior affordable housing in response to COVID-19. And she has taught design studios at the Boston Architectural Center and RISD. Patricia was recently awarded the top 40 under 40 for sustainable design by Impact Design Hub. And she completed her undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Michigan. Will you please join me in welcoming Joseph and Patricia to the stage. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, no, we're excited to be here this evening and excited to be sharing some of our work with you all and looking forward to the conversations ahead. I'm going to pass it over to Patricia to get us started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Those of you that are in person, this is my first in person lecture in a very long time. It is quite a pleasure. And for those of you who's up there still joining on Zoom, I'm glad this could be accessible to you as well. It seems like a wonderful uh, time to be here. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about our global practice, how our um, work has evolved and some of the work that we're doing here locally in Santa Fe. Joseph and I will be passing the microphone back and forth a bit. We'll try not to make you dizzy, um, but we'll open up to questions at the end. So please, we welcome the conversation. There we go. Unfortunately for many of us, this image is not too startling. It's actually quite familiar. It's the spaces that we've been in for the last two years as a global pandemic. 
understanding this link between the spaces that we occupy, the spaces we live in, what we build, what we what we um, what we design actually affects people's health. It affects what they the air that they breathe. This connection between health and design is something that we all know. It's at every dinner table. It's how we make decisions about whether or not we will come and sit in a lecture or whether or not we'll stay at home. And we understand the spatial implications as designers. Um, we are now much more equipped at talking about the impact of design. We're much more equipped to talk about why buildings matter and how important it is to the daily lives that we lead. When we first started working in 2008 together as Mass Design Group, we were approached by two doctors who understood this much better than any of us did at the time and that meant that many of us actually understand today. Dr. Paul Farmer, um, the recently deceased, amazing leader mentor to Mass Design Group, I'd be remiss not to mention his importance to our organization. He led and founded Partners in Health, a global health um, organization that works across the globe, bringing a preferential treatment of health to the poor. He thinks about health in the broadest of terms, um, describing healthcare and the services that doctors provide, not just in medical terms and as medicine, but as infrastructure, as roads, as schools, as this very holistic understanding, um, and really set the vision for how we, we began our work. His partnership with Dr. Agnes Binwahu of the Rwanda Ministry of Health, when they came together, their vision about what was possible in Rwanda in 2008 um, really led our, our work and what became our first project. They introduced us to a project that had been built in the Tagula Ferry um, in South Africa called the Tagula Ferry Clinic. This clinic was the site of the multi-drug drug resistant tuberculosis outbreak where many people who were affected by this infectious airborne disease, again, we all understand now, this disease was spread in the community, but it was also being spread in the hospitals where people were coming to seek treatment. They were gathering in waiting rooms that were not well designed for ventilation, for airflow, for people to come together or to even triage where people could be isolated or separated, those that were infected from someone who might've broken an arm. And so they saw the uptick uh, and rise of this epidemic in, in South Africa, and the epicenter of it was in this hospital, in this hallway that was not designed for infection control. And so when we were approached by Dr. Paul Farmer and Dr. Agnes Mahu to work with them to design a hospital in Rwanda, we looked at that precedent and we understood and really questioned what was possible with a hospital in Rwanda? Was it possible to think about how a building not only could deliver better health, access and better health outcomes, but actually build something that could heal. Rwanda, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, is a landlocked country in East Africa. Um, we were asked to build that hospital in Bataro, which is in the northern province of Rwanda. At the time, there were zero doctors for over 300,000 uh, residents in that, in that district. They were building the first hospital. It had no electricity. There were no roads. There was very little infrastructure. Um, and in that, we were able to see the incredible beauty of Rwanda, its climate, the hills. Um, it's the site of seven, five of the seven volcanoes in the Virunga Mountain region. Um, it's an incredible place to be, it is beautiful. And so the question became, how could we create a hospital or a building that could heal that was also respectful of its context and its place, of its people, and the deep needs that were, were really present in this community? And so this is an image of the Batara District Hospital um, as it stands today, and it was designed by our team in 2008, finished in 2010. It sits on the top of the hillside where there was no other infrastructure. Um, we brought in solar panels, we brought in resilient systems for water. When we thought about how we could site the building, we thought about it not as the single building that would be connected by hallways, but as a campus of independent buildings that were connected by outdoor walkways essentially getting rid of that exact principle that we learned at the Tugula Ferry Clinic, not to create hallways that didn't have fresh air and access to natural light. This allowed us to think about the patient circulation and the doctor circulation, how people could actually you know, work their way through the hospital safely. 
we thought about the air flow and the wards themselves. This is an, a sectional perspective cutting through one of the main wards. You can see the sort of doctor's offices and workspaces below with a separate kind of circulation path over there to the right. And then the wards where patients were brought together and through simple measures of natural ventilation, by thinking about how we could bring air in low, have it exit high, ways we could amplify that by reversing the direction of a fan at the top to pull the air out and through the space. We could create better air quality and, and air exchanges that were necessary to create safe measures for infection control. Literacy at the time in Rwanda was incredibly low. And so one of the other principles or thoughts that we thought about as the needs of this community was, was how do people know where to go? How will people find their way? And so by color coding, each ward and each department, people were able to connect through the space, not by relying on literacy or words, but just on color alone. We also leveraged research to make our design decisions. There was research out that patients that had access to natural, um, natural light and to views of nature healed faster. So typical wards, um, when we're thinking about you know, multiple people or multiple patients in one space, they're typically on the perimeter of the room facing inwards and looking at each other. And we thought, why is that? And it's because of the infrastructure, you know, the, the actual equipment that's needed right down the center. And so we reversed how people thought about the wards. And we thought, if we can just put all that infrastructure in a central, central wall, running down the center of the ward, we can then prioritize the patients, transition their beds to face outwards and giving each patient a view to the outdoors, of a view to nature, and for that dignity and additional privacy that comes with it. We thought not only about what the building design was, but also about who would build it. And this became a really important, critical moment in this project's trajectory. We had choices that we could make to either bring in imported labor, imported materials. We had choices to make about who would build it and where they were coming from. Throughout this project, we decided to prioritize the impact that this building could have and all of the dollars that were coming to support its construction, leveraging those to create economic and environmental impact in the local community. Choices around the exterior materials, the volcanic stone. Volcanic stone throughout Rwanda is everywhere. You have five of the seven volcanoes in your country, you have a lot of volcanic stone. And in this region in particular, it's, it's mounded on the sides of farm, uh, farmlands because it's sort of seen as a nuisance. You wanna kind of get rid of the volcanic stone to get to the rich soil. And so this is piled up on the sides of the roads, it's piled up on the sides of the properties. And so we thought, is there a way to use this material differently? Is there a way to elevate it? Because it's here, it's local, and it's incredibly affordable. And so working with local masons, highlighting here one of our um, entrepreneurs in Mason Takiza who's worked with us on a number of projects, working with him and masons like him, came up with a whole new way of working with this volcanic stone material. It's essentially using a chisel and formwork to cut the stone just so, so they fit together perfectly, like a jigsaw puzzle. And over time, working with Akiza and his team, the, the refinement of the masonry got better and better and better. And you kind of see it here as we, as again, as we started to think about more about what else we could do in this community. Um, one of the needs that arose, well, now we have a hospital. We need more doctors. Where are we going to house those doctors in this rural area? There's no other place for them to stay. So we designed the and built the Pataro Doctors Housing using the same principles that we had developed and thought about throughout the hospital. There's phase one and phase two, doctors housing and doctor share housing on the same hill, recognizing that we had created a hospital that was now um, providing all these sort of infectious disease um, opportunities for doctors to see and triage and treat these patients, we were now seeing a rise and an uptick in non-communicable diseases like cancer. And so cancer, this became the largest and only cancer treatment center in East Africa. It was supported with the Dana-Farber Dana um, Cancer Institute that's based in Boston. And they set up and asked us to design and build the cancer treatment center that now not only is a treatment center, but also has um, housing for patients who, and families who are going through oncology treatment. And lastly, you know, one of our more recent projects finished just uh, in 2020 is the University of Global Health Equity, a large campus that really lives out this mission of Dr. Agnes and Dr. Paul Farmer, who saw this campus, this part of Rwanda, no longer just as a place that had a beautiful hospital, 
but really a place where people could come and learn about what's possible when we think about health in its broadest terms. This is a campus that trains Rwandans and Africans from all over the continent in the best practices of global health. There's a campus as well as the housing um, that sits on the site today. And this is how we think about why and how buildings can heal. That buildings can be more than just what they are, it can be more than just a hospital. And we can think not just about what it is, but what it can do. I'd like to share with you just a little video about some of the work that has been inspired by this way of thinking over Mass's last 10 years. We've built over 30 different projects in that time frame in 20 different countries. So uh, thank you to our film team who produced that amazing piece that kind of showcases and, and, and tells a little bit about the story of Mass's first 10 years. That kind of leads us to this statement, design is never neutral, it either heals or hurts. And our mission as an organization is to research, build, and advocate for an architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. Building on that kind of first 10 years, I think we're looking at ways in which we can think about the role of the architecture field, right? We're, and in many ways, we're not just architects, we're not just engineers 
planners, designers to build buildings, right? We're architects to protect and save our planet, to improve the communities in which we all live and to awaken the links that bind us inextricably to one another. And what I think MLK or Martin Luther King called the inescapable network of multitudinity. I think this, this kind of idea is thinking about how we're rethinking practice itself. Uh, we support, we help organizations to amplify their missions. Uh, and as you can kind of tell through the video, we partnered with over 100 organizations and community leaders in 21 different countries. And I think what we're really excited to be doing is understanding how that expands here uh, in what we now call the United States and, and North America. Uh, as you kind of see by the graphic on the right, uh, what I think we're trying to kind of communicate here is we often work upstream uh, of the architecture process. We often partner with mission aligned partners uh, that are kind of seeking change in how they're thinking about the built environment, how their buildings, how their environments can change or impact the communities that they serve and inevitably supporting them and how we think about the built environment. So, uh, Alan, one of our founders, likes to say our first long and longest and first largest and longest running project is the design of our practice. Uh, and as you can kind of tell, we've grown exponentially over the 10 years to kind of think about ways in which we're serving the communities in which we're posi positioned to be kind of working and practicing in. Um, and I, and this idea of expanding has been something that we've been really focused on over, over the past 10 years. And if you bring up this slide, I think to highlight all the different places where, where we've been able to do work and touch communities' lives and, and work together um, with people. And a lot of that work in the first 10 years is really based in Africa, in East Africa, West Africa, and Haiti. And the challenge really for us has been in the last you know, three or four years has been to understand what those principles of practice mean for us here to be working um, in many of our home communities. And so one of the ways, so one of the things that we've learned in this time frame is that we actually need to define healing in the broadest sense of the word. Um, we have to come to understand what it means beyond just physical health. Justice and equity, justice and beauty are also necessary to achieve public health. The National Memorial to Peace and Justice, um, shown here on the slide, is the first national memorial to victims of lynching and racial terror in the United States. It honors the over 4,000 historical victims of lynching. The memorial, built in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative based on, on their model of peace and reconciliation, is designed as a pavilion that rests on the top of the hill at the center of the city of Montgomery, Alabama. As you enter into the memorial, you're faced with these columns that bear the names of the counties where someone was lynched and the name of each person that we know of that was also Lynch. But as you go further into the memorial, you see the ground drop and these columns rise above you, reflecting the public hangings that often happen in the public square. The memorial sitting on the site in Montgomery's highest points is a reflection of our history as a nation. It's a reflection of the truth it's a reflection of all of our roles in the terror and, and violence that happened and still happens today. The memorial is positioned on the site to point also towards the landmarks of civil rights within the city, linking itself to a greater and larger narrative. The memorial also sought to look for opportunities to create impact in Montgomery where it would stand. It has seen hundreds of thousands of visitors over the course of its opening since 2018. It also, throughout the construction, leveraged local labor, local contractors, and employed over 400 people. And environmentally, over 80% of the building's uh, materials by weight come from within 
100 miles of the site, reducing the carbon footprint of the memorial itself. Mass Design Group, our firm also with EJI to uh, work with the Equal Justice Initiative to design a community-based initiative, a process by which community members could collect soil from the sites where lynchings occurred, contributing to this growing call for racial justice, asking those interested to conduct this simple act from every site of lynching and giving every victim an urn where they were killed. The urns then are filled with the soil and are brought to EJI's headquarters in Montgomery, Alabama, where they stand together, reflecting both the intimate, the individual, the uniqueness of each life that was taken and the infinite, the magnitude, the depth that this trauma has had on our nation and that we are still healing from today. One of the other ways that we have been thinking and, and working to try to understand how architects can do more and how we can expand the practice is to also think about ways in which buildings can heal in our most intimate of spaces, um, in our homes. This is an image of the Haven Domestic Violence Center in Bozeman, Montana. And we're working with this organization uh, called Haven um, to build a new public facing shelter for survivors of domestic violence. For over 40 years, Haven has been working to support women impacted by domestic violence in Bozeman and the surrounding areas. Um, domestic violence really has been viewed as a private issue, one that's not discussed publicly, leaving many of its survivors to face their trauma privately or risk the stigma of being seen as a victim. By providing this new facility for survivors that keeps them safe while also welcoming the community to take ownership of these issues, Haven aims to end this stigma of domestic violence. And they do so by creating, as I mentioned, this public facing, a disclosed location for domestic violence shelter and encourage the broader community to participate in this healing through community engagement, advocacy, education, and prevention. Haven's new shelter also aims to restore dignity through design and specifically is designed aligned with Haven's programmatic model of providing trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care is a model of practice of delivering care with compassion, of asking not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you, providing a holistic approach to meeting the needs of survivors and their families. The five principles, these are the five principles of trauma-informed care on the screen. They look they describe themselves as you know, safety, trust, choice, collaboration, and empowerment. And through this project, we looked for ways that we could create design solutions that responded to these principles. Could we create a space that actually felt safe for these survivors? Could we create spaces that promoted trust, choice, collaboration, empowerment, and specifically to Haven's model, an attitude or principle of treating the whole person? And so this is the plan on the left of, of the two buildings that are built as a part of this campus. The one at the top is a more public facing building, creating that kind of space in which we can invite more people to participate in, in recognizing and reducing the stigma of domestic violence. And then also the resident building towards the bottom of the screen, which promotes sort of additional layers of security, safety, and trust. Some of the specific design solutions we looked to, to leverage were creating diversity of space where people had choice about where they wanted to engage or be public or private or exposed or to interact or to be um, alone. We minimize hallways, blind spots, and any kind of, um, kind of opportunity where people might feel insecure about what's around the corner. We look for opportunities to create spaces for children. Children are a part of this process. They often come with the survivors, they're survivors themselves, and we create dedicated space for children and adults to heal. We created visual connections so that people can see each other, to know where they're going. So a, a concept of prospect and refuge, to be able to feel safe and secure and see what's going on, but also understand when I can refuge or retreat, that I have the opportunity to leave that situation if it feels unsafe or insecure, which gets into also sight lines. The space of Haven 
also looks for kind of design tactics, things we can leverage, access to natural light, um, to be able to see through things, a choice of just different types of furniture and different types of, of settings. Um, we looked at the exterior of ways that we could create different entries and exits, um, as well as connections to the outdoor spaces and dedicated play spaces for children. And this is just one way in which we think about trauma-informed care. It was kind of our first entry in, honestly, the way in which Haven introduced us to trauma-informed care design principles really led us to a body of work researching in other, um, sorry, in other um, areas of the United States with a grant from the Enterprise Community Partners it's called Enterprise Resilient Communities. We were partnered with POA, the Preservation of Affordable Housing, to really look at their program spaces, their policies, and the design of their existing affordable housing at four different sites in the United States. At those four different sites, we led a human-centered design process to engage with residents and property managers to understand specifically what the opportunities were for design in their homes that could be more trauma-informed. This is surfacing learnings that can be applied to POA's basis of design, changing the way that they design and determine unit types to their material selection. It's also leading us as one of our big takeaways from that research is that trauma-informed design is more than just tactical interventions. It's actually about thinking about a different design process. And a project in Boston um, called JJ Carroll Affordable Housing, it's affordable housing dedicated to older adults those over the age of 62. It built in partnership with Tulip Communities, an incredible developer who is really focused um, on serving the needs of seniors and seniors specifically. This is the site highlighted in white. It's almost um, a city block. It's 150 units of affordable housing. And one of the things that we understood really acutely in Boston was that we weren't just dealing with housing for seniors because of affordability issues. It wasn't just enough to provide units of housing that were affordable. It wasn't just enough to think about trauma-informed care practices and interventions. We really had to think about another public health risk for seniors, which is isolation. Something that again, we understand even more now, um, understanding how our seniors have fared in the wake of a pandemic, which has even further isolated them. This was a risk that was identified in 2018, prior to the pandemic. And additionally, a lot of what is getting built in Boston and really throughout the, the nation as affordable housing looks very much the same. It's without context, it's without place, it's without the specific in, uh, needs of residents in those communities being addressed. And so our question became, how can we make this process more trauma-informed? How can we think about bringing a resident-centered process to affordable housing? And so we engaged in a process ahead of the design actually being submitted to the city, which is not typical for um, developers to be open to. And we were able to engage with residents who actually lived on the site. The former building that sat on the site was deemed obsolete. It was creating issues for seniors where they were not only isolated, but literally shut into their apartments. Um, it was an aging facility, and so it was being torn down. And so we engaged with residents before this rehabilitation and total new construction to understand what did they love about their community? What did, they, what did they cherish? What did they want to maintain? And what did they actually want to discard? What wasn't working for them? What wasn't meeting their needs? And it uncovered a lot of really wonderful conversations and wants and needs and ways in which the design evolved. And one of the things that they called out to us was that they loved the front porch. They loved the scale of the housing. Even though they were shut in and they had issues climbing the stairs and it wasn't accessible, and there was parts of the building that were falling apart and definitely aging, they loved these moments of community and the scale at which the housing allowed eight to 10 residents to be able to gather safely and know each other. They knew their neighbors. And so that led us to a series of principles, the feedback that they gave us, create a sense of home, create a sense of place, bring community programs that will bring more of us in and closer together, create spaces that are safe and accessible and attuned to our needs and ways in which we can age in place safely. Think about intergenerational engagement. We can, as seniors, can bring a lot to communities. We can bring a lot to the youth. Being in isolation is not what the, the residents wanted. And also promoting health, ways in which we could think about broader health, bringing in fresh air, um, as well as creating spaces for health and fitness and wellness. 
this is just a quick part D diagram of how we translated some of those principles into form. Um, on the left, you have kind of the typical arrangement of affordable housing. Get it in as quickly and as tightly as possible. Um, double loaded corridors is what we see a lot of. When we thought about how we could break it up, break it up into 10 units of 10, shifting these bars to create independent neighborhoods that then are connected and centered around shared social spaces. Dividing it up into smaller groups that allowed to think of these as independent neighborhoods that exist on every floor, connected by a main street that pulls people in, allowing you to go from a private space to a semi-private space into a more semi-public space. And then lastly, on the ground floor, a real public zone that has commercial opportunities, a, a, a actual health center, a community convenience store, as well as other types of building supports that were necessary for seniors. This is the plan as it stands today. You can kind of see the, the resident so the sort of uh, neighborhood units connected together by the sort of central spine. Each one having a dedicated space and then courtyards nestled between them to provide additional access to green space. This is an image of the front plaza, the ground floor, the public space. Again, looking for ways in which we can create common form principles, clear access points, a mix of individual and group spaces and clear sight lines. And lastly, an intergenerational play area, um, an entire front garden that is dedicated to spaces that are designed for accessibility of seniors, of children, and families alike. A space where physical therapy and a ramp can be used by all age groups and where interactions throughout the community can happen more naturally. This is a, an image, the project is under construction, which we're really excited about the, um, our first affordable housing project built in Boston. And really centered around this idea of knowing and loving your neighbor. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about expanding the practice uh, and, and how we kind of started to think about this as it relates to some of the research work uh, and, and thinking about it in relationship to the research work and the lab work. And so what we ended up kind of doing is to kind of dive a little bit deeper into this, into the kind of built environment. It was to kind of understand where can we dive deeper? Uh, and we had we developed a series of labs to explore the potentials here. The Fringe Cities Lab kind of poses the question, how can design build community wealth and catalyze investment in small American cities? Really thinking about those fringe cities that have lost their purpose and, and trying to kind of understand how can we think about them uh, more creatively, right? Um, the food systems lab, food is a powerful force that, that shapes the world around us and trying to kind of understand what is the role of food, food sovereignty in the communities that we live and play and work in. Uh, deaf space and disability justice lab, can design advanced deaf spaces, uphold disability justice and uplift cultural memory. Really trying to kind of understand what is that radical, radical space in terms, of, in terms of really bringing to bear how, how, how we can think more creatively about these spaces. Uh, public memory and memorials lab. How can spatializing memory support healing and inspire collective action for generations to come? And this has kind of been kind of built out of a lot of the memorial work that we have been doing and are being asked to do around the country. Uh, the restorative justice design lab can design create a more humane system of justice that res restores individuals and communities really calling into question the incarceration system that we all know and, 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 and critique on a, on a daily basis and what is the role of architecture in that space and then the sustainable native communities design lab how can design close the wealth gap in indian country and really kind of bringing to bear what is that role uh, within that space? And so wanted to, as we think about where we are in this place um, uh, it, it, during the pandemic and COVID, I think what we wanted to do is kind of reaffirm and re kind of double down on the principles of our practice, right? Number one, storytelling as engagement, uh, similar to what we're doing today. How do we tell that story of, of the built environment within the community that we're working in? Uh, immerse in context. How are we kind of getting proximate to the communities that we're working with and those, those community champions that want, want to change uh, their communities? Uh, 
building inclusive partnerships? How are we kind of working alongside the partners uh, that, that we want to be working with and that are mission aligned? Uh, cultivating community champions, right? Lifting up and then knowing that the, they might not, lifting up those community champions that want to see change in their community. And then leveraging local fabrication, learning from the Bataro Hospital uh, and, and understanding how can we translate that low fab process to work here uh, in the States. And so I'm going to start with uh, storytelling as engagement, right? And, and lifting up uh, uh, Joe Garcia, uh, who, who, smart, who kind of states, where does the vision actually come from for the community? And he very poignantly says it should come from the members from that community where members always have input. And this is uh, the work of a, a, a close partnering firm, Akin Oceanshade Architect and, Ar Architects, and all the work that they've done in Oke Wenge, really lifting up the work uh, of the community. Right, and that similar process is a process when I moved here in late 2012, 2013 to work with the Santo Domingo Pueblo or the Kiwa Pueblo, kind of understand what was the, how, what was the role of the community in, in that process of understanding uh, what affordable housing could potentially look like. And this is an image of us literally walking from the community center to the new housing development adjacent to the rail runner, right? And knowing that we had to walk on the road, uh, how is that equitable? Uh, how do we think about uh, creating a walking path that would connect affordable housing developments that oftentimes that infrastructure gets left out when we're thinking about rural development? Uh, and this was one of the community members, right? This was a completely community designed process. Many community members never had been asked uh, what they wanted their community to look like. We had engaged, uh, we, the housing authority, engaged uh, children to elders in the process and incorporated the elements they wanted to see in their community. Uh, and that was exactly what we did. Uh, we, we gathered outside of the community center. We took a community meeting to, to the, the walking paths uh, and engaged tribal youth through the tribal elder, elders, trying to kind of understand what were the roles and, and the potentials around the built environment, right? Uh, and, and, and lifting up and thinking about like what how do we listen how how is the community being heard how how are they being understood how are they how are they sharing their thoughts and their dreams with the design team and ensuring that they're contributing to the process and that inevitably would create a sense of ownership when we think about tribal housing when we think about uh the history of housing on on tribal lands and in indian country there is there hasn't historically been a sense of ownership like this has been built with me in mind and so translating that and changing how we think about that historically. So that inevitably came to this notion of designing with community helps to create equity, equality, and positive social change. And I underscore with because we're, we're not designing for in, in, the, in these instances. And I think that goes to all the work that we're sharing tonight is how do we design with the community that we're serving. And in this case, Robert Tenario, and, and many of you that are local might know Robert. Uh, he's a, a very well-known potter within the Santo Domingo community. And so as a, as a design team, as a housing authority, trying to kind of understand what is the role of the artist in affordable housing? And that inevitably became part of the question. How are we lifting up and ensuring that they can practice within their spaces that they're living in? Uh, and, and out of much of the work uh, through a study with the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Pew Charitable Trust, uh, we understood that many were kind of uh, this issue around indoor air quality was a big, big issue. And so taking that, that making space out of the house housing unit was, was, was critical, right? And similar to how we think about making and, and how we lift up this, this notion of making. Uh, across the, the street or across the railroad tracks was an old, it was an old uh, trading post, the Santo Domingo in, uh, Indian trading post, which was uh, plan to be a new place to trade and think about how do you leverage th this infrastructure within the community, right? Leveraging the rail runner as a means to connect to the art markets in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, leveraging that stop to ensure that you can access educational services, go to UNM or go to the Santa Fe Indian School. And so kind of coining it as a rural transit oriented development and trying to kind of critically understand how we could be doing this in a rural context and using this potentially as a precedent for how we think about uh, 
housing development throughout Indian country, right? And so, as you can kind of see in this image, uh, the end the end product is that a, a 41 unit housing de development with with e each associated art art studios or shed structures, which you can kind of see see in this image, right? Lifting up the practice of the artist, uh, which 75% of the community members consider themselves makers, artists within the community, right? And and again, this this work being done uh, in in kind of with with Akin Ocean Shade architects and and trying to kind of understand the role of of, of the architect within this with this within this work. Uh, immersing in context, how do we kind of ensure that we continue to stay proximate? Uh, and and I think this is something that we're, we've also been questioning, right? This is the Washington Post defining a wasteland, the active the active othering of environments as marginal, worthless, and desolate to further narratives of industrialization, urbanization, and civilization, right? Trying to kind of understand where, what where is nowhere, and I think this idea was uh, was kind of creating this dichotomy between urban is somewhere and rural is nowhere, and inevitably this kind of false dichotomy and what you can kind of see here is that many of these spaces highlighted tend to be tribal tribal land or reservations right and what, what what we kind of learned from what we what we learned from here is that the the most what they qualify as nowhere is this is this location uh in glasgow montana which is just adjacent to the the sioux and assiniboine tribes of fort peck uh in northeastern in northeastern Montana, which is trying to kind of calm the tension where this place is. And then kind of putting this in context where we find ourselves today, right? Zoom is nowhere. And so how do we kind of double down with this idea of kind of thinking more creatively about how do we get more proximate to these places that we want to be working and want to be serving and we want to be contributing to? Uh, building inclusive partnerships. How are we kind of questioning uh, the practice in which we're building here within within Santa Fe? And then, and I think this idea of native and non-native practice. How are we kind of how are natives and non-natives working collaboratively together to kind of impact the places that we're we're serving and that we're working? <laughs> and native and non-native practice, but but seriously. <laughs> I want to try and talk a little bit about that conversation. Who historically has worked in Indian country and it has historically been non-natives. And so in many ways, how are we kind of developing and thinking critically about uh, educating and, and bringing up the, the native voice in the design profession while also lifting up the non-natives that aspire to serve in this space too. I think it's a conversation of how we're working collaboratively and collectively together. And so why are we doing this? And I go back to the Santa Domingo project, right? Working closely with a, a, a non-native led firm, Akin Olson Shade, working collaboratively with, with a native led tribal housing authority. This project wouldn't have happened if that collaboration didn't kind of go back and forth with that space uh, within those conversations. And I think this is kind of a precedent for what that collaboration could potentially be and, and should be as we move forward. And so thinking about our practice and how we think about growing and scaling in 2014, uh, we, we were 22 individuals, uh, 20, 21, 284. And so that scaling of capacity is trying to kind of understand and questioning how do we scale appropriately? How do we kind of build that internal capacity as we continue to serve the partners that we aspire to, to, to serve? And so I think this kind of, question uh, goes back to that how how do we work upstream uh, how do we kind of engage in the visioning process the planning process and then work within that traditional space of design and construction but also critiquing and thinking about that post-occupancy phase the, the kind of operation and maintenance of the building are we doing doing uh, the practice of service by kind of understanding how we have made an impact within the projects that we've, we've historically built and so it goes back to this kind of quote that you saw in, in a previous image, knowing your neighbor will transform love into power. And I think that's inevitably trying to kind of understand how are we getting into the community and understanding ways in which we can we can do that uh, more, more creatively. Uh, cultivating community partnerships, right? And I'm gonna quickly dive into another project, uh, a personal project that we're, we're engaging in um, with, the, with my tribe, the Northern Cheyenne tribe. Uh, in in what is now northwestern Nebraska, and so 
this is a run that our tribal youth go through, go to run every every winter from southeastern Montana down to northwestern Nebraska. And today they run not from bullets and gunfire. Today they run for their future, for generations to come and, and, and are yet to come, right? Late 1870s, our tribe broke out. The Shy Chief Dullknife and Chief Little Wolf broke out of Fort Robinson uh, and took their two bands north. Right. And, and there was a, a breakout there that we don't necessarily memorialize or we don't as a, a nation understand historically. And so trying to kind of understand what is the role, what is that act of healing? How do we kind of memorialize and, and think critically about this place, uh, Fort Robinson, uh, who many of our tribal youth don't don't know this place is of our own creation story of where we became and be, have become Northern Cheyenne. Uh, and so this woman, uh, Edna Seminole, kind of called into question, how are we healing? Like, we must go back and we must learn about our history if we were to have any sense of understanding our future. And so this, this idea, and this is on our wall in our office, this is an image of Edna, uh, who kind of calls into question in that word, uh, Innovo, which is a Cheyenne word for you are home questioning where is home and how do we kind of understand home more strategically? And that's in some ways a path to healing. And so who, who are we and how do we kind of think about uh, our own identities as it relates to the, to the built environment? And so these are just some early renderings of the healing trail uh, in Northwestern Nebraska that connects the breakout, uh, the breakout at Fort Robinson to the massacre site uh, adjacent to it, about a four mile trail, which we're kind of questioning, how do we reflect? How, what are the materials that we use? What are the thresholds? How do we know when we're walking on the trail? How do we know when we're not walking on the trail? Um, and, and in ways in which we're thinking critically about those spaces. What makes a healing, what makes a healing trail? What makes a trail healing is the question, is more of the question. And, Many of the times it does take that community champion. It does take that individual to kind of call into question and, and lifting up their vision and their ways in which they can kind of put words to the built and unbuilt environment. And so in many ways, we're partnering with our elders and trying to kind of interpret and use the tools of design to advocate for what should be. Uh, and then I think lastly, leveraging local fabrication uh, and, and thinking critically about what that might look like. I think I mentioned earlier Hakiza and his work with us at the Bataro Hospital. Um, his ingenuity and also entrepreneurship has grown that particular skill set into an entire new business that's highly sought after in Rwanda. It's something that we learned as a principle, but also I've seen that through many other different trades. In Rwanda, because of the kind of economic conditions where labor is actually more affordable, and materials are high cost, leveraging local artisanry, leveraging local um, craftsmanship is actually is actually possible in a way that it isn't here in the United States. For one, we've mapped out multiple different craftspeople, weavers, basket makers, um, carpenters, masons, who have all participated and able to be um, local collaborators and designers on our projects from furniture to facades. And the question as we've been working here in the United States over the last few years has really been, how do we bring that same principle into a market that's driven by other principles that's driven not by one that leverages what's local and what can be actually handmade, but leverages what's most affordable and often handmade, which was importing materials for our own projects. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what trying here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would say that. So thinking about how does that, that thinking from LOFAB in Rwanda translate to how we might think about LOFAB here and, and, and thinking more critically about how we're kind of building partisanship, right? How do we think critically about how we can leverage both the left sides and right sides, the, the contractors, the builders, and understand that uh, they too are here to kind of serve their communities. And I think this, this is a kind of collective conversation. This is an inclusive conversation. And while we might not necessarily know what this means today, I think what we're excited about is really trying to kind of be working in rural places that have historically been very conservative places to be working in. The, the communities adjacent to reservations, the, the reservations in many cases themselves, and really trying to kind of understand 
how can design, how can we design systems, how can we design uh, ways of building and thinking more critically about the built environment in these kind of places of tension, which I think we're constantly trying to kind of uh, reframe and, and contextualize uh, in, in ways that I don't think we've done before. And so that's kind of how we're maybe thinking critically about uh, these five principles. Uh, I think we're trying to kind of have a, have a dialogue with them, have a tension with them internally, and then just try and, and, and dive deeper in, into the work that, that, that started 10 years ago. So this notion that buildings can hear, feel, that architects, engineers, planners, designers can heal as well. So thank you. Roger, you mentioned Dr. Paul Farm, one of my heroes in the wonderful book. Yeah. Crown of the Brown Mountains. How did Deep become associated with mass? Did he find you? Did you guys find him? It's a, it's a lovely little story. Um, so Paul Farmer was giving a lecture probably back in 2006 that our executive director at the time, Michael Murphy, attended as a student at the Graduate School of Design while he was getting his architecture degree. He attended this lecture where Paul was talking about his work around the globe and was talking about public health and describing it in terms of public infrastructure, schools, hospitals, roads. And so after the lecture, as legend now has it, Michael went up to Paul Farmer at the end of the lecture and just asked a simple question. What architects are you working with? Like, I need an internship. <laughs> you know, like, well, who can I work with that does this work? And Paul looked at him and said, no one. Architects have never approached us to be a part of this process. And the last hospital I designed, it was on the back of a napkin. And so when Paul then asked Michael, I think later on that, you know, that summer end of the semester, do you want to come to Rwanda? I've got a laundry building. <laughs> and so Michael and some colleagues decided to, you know, go and, and do the best laundry building they could possibly do. And, and years later, um, maybe the six months or a year later, when he was, a, when Paul was doing the hospital in Rwanda and was given the opportunity to a real district hospital, reached back out and it said a spark into the student body at the GSD, leveraging our, our now colleagues and as, as basically designers who you know, were students at the time, working with Paul Farmer to live up to what we see now as the Batara District Hospital. And so throughout that, you know, our entire, you know, we were first incubated by Partners in Health as an organization, as a nonprofit. Paul was a mentor to so many of us, challenging us, questioning us, pushing us to think more broadly about what architecture could do and to really pursue this idea that justice is beauty. And, and not settling, I mean, what Paul cared about on these campuses was the landscape. He loved the landscape. He pushed us to think not just about the building, but beyond it, um, to think about koi ponds, to think about all the different kind of important pieces that were special to people who were gonna occupy these buildings. And, and that's really the foundation of what we do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, we do a lot of adaptive reuse now. I mean, I think to, to your point, the most sustainable building is the one that already exists. And so a lot of that work we've seen, especially in our cities, in Boston and Poughkeepsie, New York, um, where we have incredible building stock that needs to just be rethought, re-envisioned, reimagined to either meet the current needs of the community and also retain that character. So it is, it's a lot of the work that um, our team up in Poughkeepsie that leads the Fringe City Lab really invests in um, and has been leading our, as, as we're all kind of taking on these different questions, it's one of the questions they've really been, been pushing us in. Anything to add? 
right. Yeah, but yes, yes, and yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. Let's ask Brianna. Yes. Okay. I can actually let you guys go back to that one. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was an amazing lecture. Uh, so we're going to move now to our award ceremony part of the program. But before we do that, I have a plug. Uh, just uh, because we have an almost filled room and, and a lot of people on Zoom. Monday, one of our jurors who is with us tonight, Rania Goshen, uh, she and her partner, El Hadi Jazadi uh, of Design Earth will be lecturing here in person on Monday. And this is an amazing practice too. Uh, so I hope you can join us at 5.30. I, I always tell Rania, I always keep her book on my desk because it is just such an inspiration. Uh, and I hope you all join us for, uh, for, for that lecture on Monday. And just as a weird uh, moment of synchronicity, um, Rania was right in the middle of the picture of Michael Murphy getting that hospital job because she was his TA. <laughs> and I, I won't tell I won't tell the whole story. <laughs> but but she was his TA and really encouraged him to do it. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and before we start, um, Alan Oliver uh, joined us, uh, um, the executive director of the Thornburg Foundation. So I'd love to have Alan come down and just say a few words about this award program. Alan. Thank you, Robert. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be brief, and I just want to thank again Mass Design for a wonderful lecture. Um, we've had the privilege of working them a little bit on a project in Gallup and uh, with uh, Gallup Battery Family Services, and uh, I'm really grateful for their work working with Emily and Ellison on creating a trauma-informed um, domestic violence shelter out there in a beautiful design. Uh, it's it's lovely to see, and it's lovely to have world class architects here in New Mexico working alongside um, some of our nonprofit partners. So um, I'm I'm just going to say we're uh, so the Harner Awards, the Jeff Harner Awards, been around for 15 years. Um, started uh, by my, our founder Gareth Thornburg, um, and it was uh, in honor of his friend Jeff Harner, um, who passed away at the young age of 46, and um, was done because he uh, our Board chair loves contemporary architecture, loves the beautiful um, designs that uh, Jeff helped build and so many wonderful architects in Mexico helped build. And, um, and also uh, just for our foundation and what we do, which is invest into um, good government reform, uh, sustainable food, thinking about um, how do we help uh, children in need, families in need, uh, and then thinking about how how can we do things better? Like innovation is really something that's really crucial to us. And often, uh, and I have a young aspiring architect up there who's 12, <laughs> um, uh, it's how does, how does design uh, make for a better world for um, our future? And so with that, we uh, were very proud to found the Harn Awards and very proud of the work that UNM has been doing. And so. With that, I'll stop and hand it right back to Dean Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to turn the um, turn it over to our um, our MC for tonight for for the Oscars uh, here at Pearl Hall, Tony Fetes. Uh and who's going to turn the pages very carefully so no one. No one gets a spoiler. You are? I guess so. Okay. Here you go, Tony. Take it away. Make sure that I do this right. Ooh, yeah. And I, I actually oh. keep these here. Oh. Yeah. I'm used to uh, normally just speaking without a script, so this is a little uncomfortable for me, but we'll make it through this and uh, hopefully uh, 
without any uh, speed bumps here. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, before we begin, I'd like to briefly say a few things about Jeff Harner and introduce our jury. Uh, Jeff's designs have stood as a beacon of architectural creativity and experimental spirit in Santa Fe from his early practice in 19, and this is not working. There we go. All right. Um, experimental spirit in Santa Fe from his early practice in 1984 until his untimely passing in 2006. Raised in Albuquerque, he earned his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Arizona State University in 1977. He ran a residential design and construction business until opening a Santa Fe office. Jeff worked organically synthesizing material, cultural, environmental resources into an architecture of his time. Jeff created an impressive body of work, furiously creating contemporary buildings in Santa Fe with a degree of risk and extreme creativity. This award inspires designers with Jeff's, Jeff Harner's exploratory spirit and his skill at guiding clients who followed his path. Um, and with that, um, it's time for the awards. So um, our jury this year was comprised of three groups and I'll introduce each great jury group as we present each category. So we'll begin with our student submissions. And I first wanna thank the jurors, uh, Renee Davids, professor of architecture and urban design at the College of Environmental Design, University of California, Berkeley. Um, Alexandra Jasky, as Assistant Professor of Architecture and Sustainable Design at the University of Texas at Austin. And Frederick, or Fritz Steiner, is the Dean and Paley Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. Um, Fritz joins us today in person to present the award, or as we present the awards. And Rene will join us via Zoom. I believe he's on Zoom. We will figure out how to do yes. that through the process. <laughs> And after we present each award, I would like ask like would like to ask the jurors to comment on the projects. So we'll start with the student award for architecture. Um, this is the second prize, and the second prize goes to <laughs> drum roll, <laughs> Brittany Sawyer of the University of New Mexico for her project. <laughs> Is Brittany here? Brittany! <laughs> we have a few images from her project up here. As we'll click through. And Fritz, would you like to make a few comments about Brittany's work? Or Renee. Or, or Renee. Renee. Um, or Renee. I hear Renee. I, um, sure. We were really excited about yeah, both. Oh, can you hear me? All right. We can hear you. Can we hear um, Renee? We were Renee. really excited about. Uh, well, first Hello. of all, congratulations. Uh, we, uh, it, one of the uh, gratifying things is to see who is behind the number. And uh, one reason your project uh, stood out among many is just um, how connected to the place it was. Um, it was sensitive to the place, yet very distinct. Um, and um, we also were quite impressed by um, your um, thoughtfulness of engaging children uh, in the building design. So congratulations. That's great. Um, Renee, I heard you on there before. Would you like to? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can only echo Fritz's uh, comments and also say that uh, I, we were particularly impressed with um, the design of the corridor as a social space. Um, it seemed very imaginative and a, a really potent um, design idea. And um, I, I sort of, we were really impressed, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, with all the awards or all the 
projects, not just the awards, uh, and particularly taking into account that we had gone through COVID and um, it was particularly difficult time for the students. Um, and the corridor itself seemed like uh, a, a place to meet and to come together and to maybe get out of the COVID spirit. Um, so it, it seemed uh, particularly potent um, sort of design gesture at this time. Thank you for those comments, Renee. And the next award is the first prize for the student award for architecture. All right, drum roll again. <laughs> and this award goes to, the first prize award goes to, there we go, a little delay. Uh, Gina Frenet of the University of Colorado, Denver for her, sub her submission, uh, Chatfield Reservoir Nature Center. And uh, um, I was wondering yeah. if anyone would be able to let me know if Gina is on Zoom at all. Hi, I am on Zoom. I'm sorry, uh, Gina. Yeah. My webcam does not work on the computer I'm on, but um, thank you so much. Uh, that's really exciting. I, I wish we could see you as well, but uh, congratulations uh, on behalf of the, the jury. We were really impressed by how sensitive the, the design was in relation to the place, uh, the relationship to the reservoir on the one hand and the woods on the other, um, the careful uh, relationship uh, of the building to the trail uh, and the fact that the trail was even reinforced with uh, a, a bridge was, which was created above. The whole project seemed to work as a threshold at several levels, a threshold between the man-made areas of the landscape and the non, uh, the landscape which was had little interference of, of man, a threshold between um, the reservoir and uh, the, the woods. And uh, we thought the drawings were really beautiful and it was really sensitively uh, produced and done. So congratulations, Gina. Uh, just to, to add, um, this was a, a project about a nature center. So it was nice to see that it was really connected to nature. Uh, that may seem like a, <laughs> Uh, uh, an obvious thing to, to say, but it was the um, sort of understanding of uh, the Colorado landscape, the understanding uh, of the flora and fauna. And it was also um, a very thoroughly done project uh, and it was resolved. Um, and then one other thing uh, to add and congratulations um, that um, we were impressed by all the students because this, is, this has been a a really, really challenging uh, couple of years. And to go the extra distance and put your work together for the competition, uh, all the students um, that entered, we, we applaud. Um, but this one, we, we really believe uh, deserves uh, first place. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks for the, the feedback and, and all of that. I really appreciate it. Thank you again to the jury and thank you everyone and congratulations, Gina. Um, and also just to let everyone know, um, these are only just a few summary images that we've placed in the award ceremony here. Um, once you go out for the reception, I'll roll in a big TV set so you'll be able to see the posters that were composed uh, for the competition. So you'll see a little bit more work um, for each of these projects. Um, Next, we go to the Student Award for Landscape Architecture. And uh, first, we'll start with second prize. Um, and the second prize goes to Alex Bullock of UC Denver 
for his project, Wasted Spaces and Carbon Sinks Restoring the Prairie. Alex, do you happen to be on at all? Ah, yes, I am. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words or should I pass it over to the jury? I'm just very flattered. I believe in this idea and I'm glad that something simple and hopefully powerful caught your attention. Thank you very much. You know, Zoom is good for something. I, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, um, it's really great that um, uh, I, I have to uh, admit, I, I used to teach at UC Denver and I'm, I'm sort of having this pride right now of uh, uh, the, the folks up in uh, Denver. But uh, this was um, one, of, um, uh, one of the things that impressed us about many of the student entries were how they were taking on some of the most um, um, amazing issues of our time, uh, including uh, carbon and what do you do with it. Um, and uh, just a personal note, I, I helped design Pena Boulevard. So uh, <laughs> this was a, a, a site I knew very well. And so I, I uh, uh, really applaud you for uh, the excellent job of uh, taking the waste of space uh, along there and turning it into uh, something very useful and profound. So congratulations, Alex. Renee, want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I can only echo Fritz's comments. Um, we were really impressed um, with the landscape entries um, this year. Um, Last year, we had more problems in finding uh, projects we wanted to award. And this year, there was, uh, we easily found um, at least these two projects and also others that were handling and dealing with the landscape really sensitively. So uh, congratulations. It's, it's um, really exciting to see the people who've the awards, not just seeing the anonymous drawings. So thank you for being here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comment. Congratulations, Alex. And now on to our first prize for the student award for landscape architecture. And the award goes to, drum roll, Christina Neighbor, University of New Mexico, a new deal for urban stormwater, deep urbanization, consolidation. Very dark space to take pictures. A light room. All right. And pass it on to. Oh, to boy. Me. Congratulations. Uh, we love this project. And what, one of the things that was so strong about it was um, like any good landscape architect, you did a very thorough job with the site analysis and understanding the, the site. But then um, moving it to uh, this level of resolution, uh, again, a very important uh, issue that we face. Uh, what do we do with stormwater? How do we clean it? Um, and especially in this region, uh, water is so precious. Uh, so your, um, your intervention, your design was extraordinarily well done and um, all of the jury members were truly impressed. So congratulations. Yeah, I can only add that uh, it wasn't just the technical aspects of the project, but I thought we thought it also had a poetic dimension, um, which we really enjoyed and liked. Um, so that's all I have to add. And sort of, it, it, it seemed like a very special project. And congratulations, really well done. 
And if I can add, just like Fritz did, uh, I feel a sense of pride myself because I used to teach at the University of New Mexico. And now so, we move on uh, to the professional <laughs> awards and we'll start off with the Unbuilt Architecture Award. Oh, before you do that, I meant uh, the jurors. Yes. Oh, yeah. sorry, that's right. I have a script in front of me, which I'm not using. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I'll just say a few words about the jurors for this um, category. Um, we're pleased to have all of them with us today. Um, and the jurors for this category are Renya Gosen, uh, Associate Professor of Architecture and Urbanism at MIT, uh, Carlos Jimenez, a Professor of Architecture at Rice University, and Gabriel Diaz Montemayor, Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Arkansas. And we're grateful to have all of you here with us. All right, now it's time for the winner of this category. And the winner is John Anderson Architecture for the Kiwa Child Care Family Emergency Center of Santa Domingo Pueblo. Yep. Yeah, you guys all can come up to talk, speak to it. So. I need the mic maybe. To okay. <laughs> I'm happy to take it. All right. All right. Here's the yeah. Come on. Big action for him. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe I'd start with a few words. First, congratulations, Jeff, and thank you for this beautiful project that I think gives great justice to the spirit of the Jeff Garner Award as introduced by our dear Dean as made explicit by the lecture this evening. I think in that is a very experimental, creative, but also aspirational project that chooses on who one does work with, uh, in what means, to which values, and to which materialities. And I think kind of the sense of giving value to the craft, the sense of um, bringing community together through kind of the sensibility of uh, programming, but also that the possibility of these Unbuilt Architecture Awards is to embed uh, a recognition within the discipline that hopefully will help the next fundraising project and bring it to fruition. So this is definitely one of the projects that we would like to see again in the Built Architecture Award category. Thank you, Ray. Yes, congratulations. And uh, uh, all of us in the jury, the three of us were very taken by this project, uh, primarily because of its dignity, its modesty, and also its lyrical beauty. It's a project that speaks a lot about culture, but also speaks about the culture of materiality and how the materiality can make edit that culture. And we were taken also by subtle little details that we thought were often not possible to do. We know this project does not have a lot of budget, and we were very taken by that, that uh, devotion to those details that appear rather casual, but they I know they're hard to do. So I hope you're able to fulfill them. And one of them is we loved the uh, sort of place where you play games and even the fact that the, the seeds have a color that recalls that culture without being covertly insistent and little details throughout that, that we could go on. But really congratulations for doing so much with, with the best. Just one other thing that we spoke about as well in our deliberation was uh, the uh, part, in, part of the narrative where it was very clearly described that this is a project uh, that uh, emanates from a community-oriented uh, process, you know, working with the community. Uh, we just heard a fantastic lecture on working with or designing with as opposed to for, right? And uh, the project seems to emanate as described from that. I, I, it is not just a, when I say seems, it's, it's something that is uh, very well written, but also you can see that uh, with evidence in the uh, graphics. So hopefully the wish it gets healed. <laughs> All right. 
And in the next uh, category for the professional awards for unbuilt landscape architecture, I should have printed on one side, but I didn't want to waste paper. Um, the winner for this project is Super Bloom uh, for the project 1881. And is anyone from Super Bloom here? Diane Lipopotsky and Stacy Passmore? Yes? Hi. Yes. Hi. All right. And Diane, we're both here. Hi. Oh, oh. Oh, they're on Zoom. All right, we're looking up here. <laughs> it's funny, everyone's pointing. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very we, much. Uh, in our deliberations, uh, we also found this project uh, to be, I would say, uh, very complete. Uh, it, it hits all of the uh, uh, points, uh, uh, if we could say something like that, for a contemporary landscape architecture project. It, it is uh, uh, rooted in a significant uh, narrative, significant history. Uh, it is uh, compelling uh, uh, as, as a design. Uh, yesterday in our roundtable, we were talking about how uh, a lot of landscape architecture is uh, apparently is uh, uh, fundamentally focused in uh, systems, ecology. Uh, and this one is, but it, this one also incorporates a spatial formal thinking, uh, which uh, uh, in that regard is definitely uh, uh, manages to put together uh, that complexity. Um, another important thing to comment is that the, the program uh, is uh, uh, making a, a gesture, of course, a foundation to history, but also has uh, the services and functions to um, educate uh, on uh, sustainable agriculture, uh, traditions, practices, and also has some uh, architectural components that I will let my uh, architectural colleagues speak about more. Yes, um, congratulations. We we were really um, we discussed this project in many levels, as uh, Gabriel mentioned already. Some of it, but one of the things that we found particularly interesting was the delicacy of the. Uh, Architectural elements, how they did not compete with the larger landscaping. How they, and we were also very much um, aware that this is almost a uh, a festival like uh, design in the sense that it celebrates both the history of the place, the potential of the place, and how it educates those that come to experience that place. So we found it very rich in its narrative and worthy of this uh, award. So, congratulations. I mean, the closing comment can only be a, a round of congratulations to Super Bloom and family and for kind of bringing a sense of the future of a, a, a beautiful relationship of a working land. Like how can we imagine uh, kind of a, a relationship that recognizes a history but begins to imagine a, a way of living with the land and with, living with each other on that land. And I think uh, to that uh, promise of that future, we're very, um, humbled and, and appreciative of what you bring to us. So thank you. Thank you so much. Stacey, Diane, any, any final words before we jump to the next award? Yes, thank you. And I think, I mean, as you can probably tell, this project is a, a huge collaboration between many, many people, not only our internal team at Superbloom, but also Shape Architecture and the, the numerous um, artists, farmers, uh, academics, experts, the huge range of people that have um, supported the development of this project too. So we are very, very grateful for, for your recognition. Thank you so much to the jury and congratulations. To the jury. All right. Jurors. Jurors. I will remember that this time. So now we're moving on to the final category, the big category for the evening, which is the Contemporary Architecture in the Southwest Award. Um, 
Two of our three jurors are joining us via Zoom today. Uh, we're sorry that Deborah Burke, Berkey uh, from the Dean of School of Architecture at Yale University cannot join us today. Our two other jurors are joining us via Zoom are Dorothy Ember, uh, Director of the Knowlton School of Architecture at The Ohio State University, and Elaine Molinar, who's the Managing Director and Partner at Snohetta. I think it might only be me here tonight. All right, no Dorothy? All right. I don't think so. All right, you have the spotlight once I, once we <laughs> announce the award here. So I'll just keep stalling and make it more suspenseful. Um, <laughs> and I also have to flip the page again. So, um, and this very prestigious award this evening goes to Sky Room by McLean U Architecture and Design. <laughs> And also as, as the team is coming down, um, one of the criteria, one of the big criteria for this award um, is acknowledging their commitment to EDI. Um, and I wanna to add to that part of submission as it was required um, for equity, diversity, inclusion statement. And I will share that with you here. Um, the text is, oh, I will have to move. The jurors off to the side. There we go. <laughs> and Robert, you, you would like me to read it? So everyone can read it. All right, we'll just leave it up there. I won't talk. So I'm not supposed to talk. And this is what I can tell from the comments that I've read um, in the in the listings. It definitely did factor into uh, the award as well, quite a bit. Um, so, um, Elaine, do you have any? Feedback? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 first, I'd like to say I remember this from the unbuilt category last year. So I'm. Uh, we were all really happy to see that it came to fruition. So that, that was uh, quite nice to see. Uh, we really appreciated this one for its strong presence, uh, but at the same time, kind of allowing it to, um, allowing the surroundings, I guess, to acknowledge the surroundings, allow this nature to take over. Um, you know, at the, it, it kind of uh, acknowledges that, that this kind of, this climate is, can be a very harsh place. You know, it's, it's, it's not um, green and lush all the time. Sometimes it is, it is quite intense. Uh, the materials, the material palette and the, the uh, materials themselves, uh, the choice of that kind of perforated metal mesh, they, they talked about it, you know, just letting it collect dust and that it, it became a transmission for sound as the wind blows through it. So um, that kind of existing with the elements really captures the spirit of the desert. And it, it's, it was it, deceptively complex. I mean, it, it looks pretty straightforward. Uh, it, it, we, could, we could figure out that, you know, that the geometry of these intersecting uh, cylinders, which created this oculus to frame the sky, which also was, was a very, very nice element. Um, and we appreciated the way that the um, engagement process, like the stakeholder engagement process through the design was carried out in a very collaborative uh, and, and seemingly very rewarding way. So um, that was a very, very nice part of the project. Uh, it, it's, it really exudes happiness. Um, and also the proposal for the prize money we felt was um, very, very direct, very appropriate, has tangible, tangible outcomes. It moved beyond being merely aspirational um, and, or, and or being solely for the benefit of, of um, you know, groups that are largely unaffected. So the, and the importance to recognize very directly the importance of travel for a designer uh, and so we thought this was just a, a great proposal for that. So all around, it, it kind of hit 
it hit all the, the marks. And you know, the, the variation it has for lighting in different at, at day, night, time of day, time of year was all very exciting. Um, it seemed like there was a close relationship with uh, the musicians and they got feedback on the acoustics, um, which is also, you know, a, a great quality. Yeah, so we were very happy, happy to select this one. Congratulations. You don't need to say that one. <laughs> But thank you so much to this community for which um, projects like these come together with the people of this community and everyone represented, like the Teachers of Life Teams, IUM, is a presence here on, uh, on the site as well as CNF and the hospitals and the city of New Hampshire. Therefore, you are our future leaders, uh, through your design, but also through your project leadership in all facets of being with our clients and allowing them to do the best product possible. So I thank you. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the award and the, uh, the evaluation committee for your participation and your time. Um, we were very happy to do this project. It's a relatively modest project, actually. It's thanks to the participants in the project that we were good and all of our is available, so we're excited about that. Uh, also, want to mention the team, the design team that's involved here, uh, involved service design team from San Francisco and the architects, and also from our web design and the architects as well. So, very big role. All right, that concludes this year's award ceremony. Um, a huge thank you to all the participants who submitted projects. Um, a, a tremendous thank you to the jury for your time in reviewing these and your wonderful uh, feedback and comments. Um, and we look forward to uh, continuing this in the next year. Um, and also just uh, from, from my end, being involved with uh, trying to coordinate the awards, um, any feedback that you have positive, negative, uh, all of the above. I would love to hear. Um, last night's jury roundtable um, was a great opportunity to get feedback. And I think uh, we learned a lot of very valuable things, but, but for all of you, those of you who weren't there last night, um, uh, please let us know uh, any feedback that you have. And thank you very much. And I'll pass to Robert just for the final words. Thank you. Um, thank you again to our jurors for coming all the way out here. Uh, our jurors uh, did this last year, uh, and it's it's an amazing process to have this kind of feedback from, from folks who are looking at projects year after year. I don't know if we can uh, beg them to do it one more year uh, or if they want to be retired, uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful process. Um, I also want to thank, again, the Thornburg Foundation for their great support uh, and all of the students uh, at the school who have been submitting. Uh, one of the things we did talk about yesterday at the round table was the potential of opening it up to more schools. If schools uh, are doing studio work that is about the Southwest or that is, you know, that is in this location and that might be a way uh, to broaden it even further, but this is something we can we can all talk about. So thank you all. Good night, and join us outside for lots of yummy food and wine and treats. Thank you. Thank you. A wonderful evening, everyone. <laughs>